If you wouldn't mind turning, please, to um, Philippians this morning, Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. And I'm going to read the first 11 verses, verse 1 through to verse 11. And the title of this morning's sermon is Calvary's Dying Love. Calvary's Dying Love. If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, Fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God hath also highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Amen. And so, Lord, Father, we come now, Lord, to the almost impossible task of laying hold and comprehending the essence this morning, Father, of Calvary's dying love. I ask, O God, for your very strength and for the Spirit of God, without which, Lord, how could we fathom the depths, Lord, of your dying love? I ask this morning that you would help me, Lord, to be able to deliver thy thy word and that by the Spirit of God your unction would rest upon me that, Lord, I might be a vessel neat for the Master's use this morning. And give us all ears that we might hear this morning and that, Lord, you would open the understanding of our hearts to grasp, Lord, so as to feel in the very core of our being your great love for us. We ask this now in Jesus' precious name. Amen. 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 Calvary's dying love. There are some things in this life that can only truly be understood by divine revelation. No amount of seeing will ever see. And no matter how many times one might hear a thing proclaimed, it's not until the penny drops, so to speak, that one really hears for the very first time. I think of the crucifixion of our Lord Jesus Christ. In recent years, this monumental scene has been depicted by film in ever bloodier detail. I guess they think that the greater the gore, the greater the impact it adds to the whole shock factor. Yet ironically, when one turns to the gospel accounts to see the actual portrayal of Christ's passion, the final periods of Jesus' earthly life, Gethsemane, his betrayal, his arrest, his trial, his scourging, his crucifixion. By way of contrast, The reader is spared from much of the bloody detail. Now we know from historians that scourging alone was so brutal that many did not make it to public execution. You see attached to those strands of that whip, that scourge, that Roman scourge, were pieces of bone and in some cases metal. 
And as that whip came thundering down upon the back of its victim, quite literally it would flay, it would strip the skin from off the very bone. Yet concerning our Lord, Matthew simply records, and when they had scourged Jesus, Matthew 27 and verse 26, Mark's account says the same, John says the same, and Luke doesn't even record the event, but instead has written Jesus' words foretelling it. And they shall scourge him, our Lord said, and put him to death. And the third day he shall rise again. Luke 18 and verse 33. As we turn now to the crucifixion scene itself, Again, brevity seems to be the way in which God wanted this climactic event to be captured. Think about it, God could have waited until the 21st century. He could have waited for the digital age, the social media age to dawn. Picture it, it's Passover, tens of thousands of people all poised with their mobile phones capturing the bloody ordeal and uploading it within minutes to Instagram for millions to see the world over. But God didn't do it that way. Instead, Matthew records again with minimal detail, Matthew 27 and verse 35, and they crucified him. Luke 23 and verse 33, and when they were come to the place which is called Calvary, there they crucified him and the male factors, the criminals, one on the right hand and the other on the left. Friends, you'll look in vain in the gospel accounts to read, to read of the stingy blows of the Roman mallet as seven-inch nails were driven through Christ's sinless flesh, lacerating the veins in his wrists. And his feet were not told of the excruciating pain he endured as he hung, suspended between heaven and earth, slumped in such a way that the only means by which he could inhale was by lifting himself up by the nails which impaled his feet. Let's not mince our words now. This morning, crucifixion on all accounts was a savage affair and a cruel one at that. The Romans had honed this torturous instrument of death to perfection, reserving it for the lowest of the low and those that were counted enemies of the state. I want to ask the question this morning, why is it that God did not choose like Hollywood does today to depict this level of gruesome detail, both in his scourging and in his crucifixion, the gospel accounts keep things to a minimal. They give the facts. They scourged him. And when they had crucified him. Well, I'm not God, of course, and I can't say for sure. But I can hazard a pretty good guess that God does not want emotion to be the principal factor in informing our understanding of the cross. It's not so much the gory detail of the death that is of importance, lest the detail should obscure the very purpose of his death. Hear the words of Peter in 1 Peter chapter 1. And verses 18 and 19, I'm going to quote some verses. 1 Peter 1, verse 18 and 19. For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things, as silver and gold from your vain conduct, received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Note where the emphasis is laid, not on the gore and the blood, but on the redeeming nature of our Lord's death. You were not redeemed with corruptible things, 
from your vain conduct, silver and gold, no, but with the precious blood of Christ. That blood atonement as of a lamb without spot and without blemish. Peter alludes to the sacrificial element of our Lord Jesus' death. The unblemished, unspotted, sacrificial lamb shedding his precious blood to redeem the world from sin. What does Paul say in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 3? For Christ has also once suffered for sins. Sorry, I've run ahead of myself. I'm reading the next one in 1 Peter. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 3. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to to the scriptures. That's Paul's account. That he received it of the Lord, how that Christ died for our sins. That was the purpose of his death, to die for the sins of the world. And Peter emphasizes now in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 18, 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 18, for Christ hath also once suffered for sins. There's the emphasis again for sins. The just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. Now please don't misunderstand me this morning that Christ suffered is clearly stated in the text of the New Testament, not least in the very passage we've just read in 1 Peter 3 and verse 18, for Christ hath once suffered for sins. The writer of Hebrews tells us in Hebrews 13 and verse 12, speaking also of his sufferings, that Jesus suffered outside the gate. He suffered. He suffered outside the gate. And Peter again in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 21 says this, Christ also suffered for us. The New Testament tells us that our Lord suffered. But I want to say this morning that the impetus, the purpose for saying so in all of these three verses that we've just read, 1 Peter 3, 1 Peter 2, Hebrews chapter 13. The impetus for referencing his suffering is not for shock value, but to charge us, the believers in Jesus Christ, to likewise share in his suffering. 1 Peter 3, verse 17, just backing up a verse, and verse 18, let's bring the context. For it is better if the will of God be that ye suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. Why? For Christ hath also once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. It's better if it be that the will of God be such that you suffer for righteousness' sake rather than for being an evil-doer. And the encouragement for us to stand amidst our suffering for righteousness' sake, being found blameless in the sight of God, is the example left us by our Lord. For Christ has once suffered for sins. The just, the righteous, for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. Hebrews 13, verse 12 and 13, again bringing context to the passage that I just read, that Jesus suffered outside the gates. Again, the impetus is for us to likewise share in his reproach. Hebrews 13 and verse 12, Wherefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered outside the gate. 
And the exhortation in verse 13, let us go forth therefore unto him. Outside the gates, outside the camp, bearing his reproach. And finally in 1 Peter 2 and verse 21, Christ suffered for us. We read this, for even unto, here unto were you called, called for what? To suffer wrongfully for righteousness sake, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps. As well as the cross being a place of suffering, and it was, of uncomprehendable suffering. As well as the cross being a place of suffering and a place of death, the cross was also a place of shame and humiliation. Who for the joy that was set before him, you know the verse, Hebrews 12 verse 2, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. As you read through the gospel accounts, what you're going to find is this, that rather than choosing to focus on the detail of his actual suffering physically, all four Gospels choose to hone in on his humiliation, the shame that he endured at the hands of sinners. Turn with me, please, to Luke chapter 22. I want to read you just from Luke's account two passages before moving on to Matthew. And I want to show you how the gospel writers record for us the shame and the humiliation that was attached to our Lord's ordeal. Not only on that cross, but indeed in the trial that came before it. In Luke chapter 22 and verse 63, Luke 22 and verse 63, we read these words. And the men that held Jesus mocked him and smote him. And when they had blindfolded him, they struck him on the face. This here is recording for us as our Lord was led to Caiaphas' house. We're told that in verse 54, to the high priest's house. And there he endured a mock trial, as it were. And we're told that the men that held our Lord, they mocked him, they smote him, they struck him. And when they had blindfolded him, they struck him on the face. Now you understand, this wasn't so much as to inflict harm now, but it was a form of mocking because of the words that went on to follow. Listen, they struck him on the face and asked him, saying, prophesy. Who is it that smote thee? Come on, you're, you're a prophet, aren't you? Blindfolded him, humiliated him, mocked him, smote him across the face. And said, prophesy, which one of us did strike? And many other things in verse 65 that Luke doesn't hear record for us. Blasphemously spake they against our Lord. And if this wasn't mocking enough, our Lord is taken now from Caiaphas' house. To Pilate, and from Pilate, he's passed to the hands of Herod. Passed from one company to another with the express aim of 
pulling this man to death and ridding Israel from his presence. We pick up the account now as our Lord is debased, abased for the second time, this time at the hands of Herod the Tetrarch and his army. Luke 23 and verse 11. Luke 23 and verse 11. And Herod with his men of war set him at naught, mocked him, and arrayed him in a gorgeous robe and sent him again to Pilate. They'd heard how he said he's the king of the Jews, or they said he's the king of the Jews. Again, they mocked him and set him at naught, put upon him a gorgeous robe, and they sent him back to Pilate. From Herod back to Pilate, and there our Lord is humiliated for a third time now. We have these words recorded in Matthew's Gospel, Matthew chapter 27 and verse 26. Matthew 27 and verse 26. And we'll read down to verse 31. Then released he Barabbas unto them, speaking of Pilate, and when he had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the common hall and gathered unto him the whole band of soldiers. They stripped him. Again, a form of great degradation and humiliation, they stripped him. They put upon him a scarlet robe, and when they had plaited a crown of thorns, you see kings wear crowns of gold, but they're in their mockery, they weave for him a crown of thorns. And they put it upon his head. And a reed in his right hand, you see rulers had a scepter. This king has a reed. They put it in the right hand of power. They bow their knee before him, all with the express aim of mocking him now. And mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they spit upon him. One of the worst forms of humiliation. You want to show your contempt to somebody. Ah, there's a way to do it without words. Just spit on them. They spat upon him. They took the reed from out of his hand and they smacked him, struck him with it on the head. And after they had mocked him, they took the robe from off him and put his own raiment on him and led him away to crucify him. For the third time, our Lord was subject to humiliation. But you see, even as he's hanging on the cross, a most shameful way to die. I mean, slit a man's throat or administer a lethal injection, it's a dignified way to die. But to hang on a cross... It's the most humiliating way to die. Not only is it torturous and brutal, it's humiliating. As men cast their sight upon that dislimbed, as it were, hanging figure on the cross, helpless, bloody, gasping for air. Even as our Lord hung on the cross, we see that the taunting continued In Matthew 27 and verse 39, then were there two thieves crucified him, one on the right and the other on the left. He bore in the shame of being crucified next to criminals, though himself he was innocent. And they that passed by reviled him, heaped insults at him, wagging their heads 
and saying, Thou that destroyest the temple and buildest it in three days, save yourself. If you be the Son of God, come down from the cross. And likewise also the chief priests, they joined in with the common folk. They too mocked him with the scribes and the elders in verse 41. And they said this in verse 42, he saved others. Himself he cannot save. If he be the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross and we will believe him. He trusted in God. Let him deliver him now if he will have him. For he said, I am the son of God. And to add insult to injury, those dying thieves to his right and left join in the merry band. The thieves also, which were crucified with him, cast the same in his teeth. That's old English. They hurled their insults in his face. What can I say this morning, brothers and sisters? How can I begin to truly convey to you Calvary's ordeal? I say again, as I said at the beginning, there are some things in this life that can only be truly comprehended and understood by divine revelation. No amount of seeing will ever see. And it doesn't matter how many times a man might hear a thing proclaimed, it's not until the penny drops, so to speak, that one really hears for the very first time. And I don't think that we can truly comprehend, nor will we ever this side of eternity, can we truly comprehend Calvary's dying love. And at best, we can begin to do so only by the aid of God's Holy Spirit in giving to us revelation. Brethren, will we not allow to sink into our hearts this morning all that has thus far been said? And with this context being set, turn again now to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 1. If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill ye my joy, that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Paul begins with his familiar stance. He begins with an exhortation. And I want you to see the conditional nature of verse 1. How many times the word if appears in that one verse. If there be therefore any consolation... In Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies. Paul's saying that if any of these qualities be present among you, church of Jesus Christ, then let them be present in the spirit of unity. This was our Lord's prayer. Remember in John 17 that they might be one and where unity abounds we're told in Psalm 133 that there the Lord commands a blessing and Paul is saying that if any of these qualities be found within us consolation comfort fellowship of the spirit tender bowels and mercies Paul says let them be found within you church of Jesus Christ let them be found among you in unity. Be of one mind. Be of the same love. Be of one accord. That means have your souls joined together. 
Fulfill you my joy, Paul says, that you be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife. Strife is where there's that competitive spirit trying to reach out for things so as to seek prominence, contending with brothers because of jealousies and envies. Paul says, look, let that not be found among you. Church of Jesus Christ, in all that you do, let nothing be done through strife. Vain glory, puffing up oneself, seeking prominence. But on the contrary, in lowliness, humility of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Let each esteem put honor, place worth on another person. Count them higher than ourselves. This is true humility. This is the humility that Paul here exhorts the church in Philippi to walk in. Not esteeming themselves. Placing honor upon themselves, worth and value upon themselves. But rather taking the low place and giving the high ground of preference to your brother or to your sister. That's true Christian love. That's true Christian unity. Look not every man on his own things, in verse 4, but every man also on the things of others. Ah, there's ever a need. Not to be so fixated on our own needs that we lose touch with the needs of our brethren. Humility is to think less of ourselves and more of others so as to compel us to think less of ourselves and to think more upon another. And when we walk with that mindset, you know what we will do? We'll not be so consumed with all our own troubles and woes. We'll look not every man on our own things, but instead we'd look up a little to identify the needs of others. And in humility, we will seek then to address those needs in love. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Now, if all that Paul had said thus far was to end here in verse 4, his exhortation was to stop, it would be enough. What sober exhortation. But Paul continues, and like a fighter jet switching on the afterburners, Paul shifts now into Mach 2, and he ups the game by a factor of infinitum. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. He's gone there. He's invoked now the name of Jesus Christ and brought him into his exhortation. There's something about the language of comparison, depending, of course, on the subject of the comparison, that can make for an explosive imperative. And what I mean by imperative is a command. For me to exhort you to run like Paul Williams is one thing. I mean, I'm not the fastest runner on the earth by any stretch of the imagination. But for me to change the subject of my comparison and to tell you to run like Usain Bolt, well, now we're into a different sphere altogether. You see, the subject of comparison is important. And Paul doesn't say, let this mind be in you, which was also in me. He takes the highest possible comparison and he says, let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. Paul, you could have stopped at verse 4 and you would have made your point abundantly clear. We hear you, Paul. Look, not every man on his own needs esteem another more high than himself. I get it, Paul. You made your point powerfully. Paul says, no, this was my mere preamble. I want to actually get now to the point. 
Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. It's as if Paul is saying here, when I speak of lowliness of mind, when I speak of letting nothing be done through strife or vain glory, when I speak of esteeming another more highly than yourselves, it's as if Paul is saying, just so that you don't get it twisted, let me take the example now of Christ's humiliation. And that's what I mean. The humility that I speak of, that's what I mean. The esteeming of another more highly than yourself, that's what I mean. The doing nothing through strife or vain glory, that is what I mean. We can point to kings and we can point to queens, to potentates and rulers, point to prime ministers and presidents and military generals. And you can put the whole lot of them on one side and you can put between them an incomprehensible chasm that cannot be spanned. And that's the difference between the degree of their glory and the glory of the risen Lord. You see, man makes much of royalty, and rightly so. But our king's royalty leaves their royalty in the dust. Who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. How can you rob something that belongs to you, is what Paul is saying. It wasn't that Jesus was assuming something he wasn't. He was God, very God himself. We're told that here in verse 6. Who being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Jesus wasn't trying to be God. Men have done that. Nebuchadnezzar, this image that I built, when you hear the sound of the sackcloth and the dulcery and the trumpets, etc., bow down and worship. But Nebuchadnezzar, you're a man. But Nebuchadnezzar, in his vanity, would say, no, I'm God. Jesus Christ wasn't suffering from a complex problem. He knew who he was. John's Gospel, chapter 1, tells us in verse 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. We're told the same was in the beginning with God in verse 3. We're told that all things were made by him and without him not anything was made that was made. Man today wants to be God. God flips it. He is God and comes down and becomes a man. Humility. Humility. That's Paul's point here. Humility. You want to look at humility? Behold the incarnation. God becomes a man. It's a step in the opposite direction. Man wants to become God. It's a step in the opposite direction by a factor of infinitum. God becomes a man. He made himself of no reputation in verse 7 and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of man. Now I can't comprehend that. I'm a man, I was born a man, born in sinful flesh with a corrupt mind. I have no true concept of what it is for God Almighty to vacate heaven's glory and to step down into a sin-filled world and to share in our identity. I have no concept the level of humiliation that is involved. Brothers and sisters, we're standing on holy ground. He made himself, he laid aside his majesty, his glory. 
And he made himself of no repute, we're told by Paul. What does humility look like, Paul? There it is. Point of contrast, there it is. He made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of man. That phrase, he made himself of no reputation in the Greek, literally means he emptied himself. Not that he ceased to be God, he never ceased to be God, he was always God, but that he added to his deity humanity in the incarnation. God became clothed with flesh. He knew what it was now to get tired and hungry, fatigued. Humility. He laid aside his majesty and his honor, his glory and his power, and he took upon himself the form of a servant. The emptying of himself is defined for us in the words that follow. He took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of man. How do we begin, brethren, to comprehend such depths of of humiliation? We can only truly understand it when we understand the height from which he came. It's a divine mystery, I acknowledge, and a divine revelation is needed. Has it ever been heard, tell me please, this morning? that a king should lay aside his royal attire to take the garment of a servant. You show me in history which king's ever done that. It's unfitting for a king. Kings sit on thrones. Kings are robed in royal attire. Kings are waited upon, but not this king. This king lays aside his royal attire and he takes to him the garment of a servant. Has it ever been heard that a king should vacate his royal throne and stoop down to serve his servants? Our Lord Jesus Christ did this very thing. But of course, we're not just talking about an earthly king now. That would be amazing enough. We're speaking about God Almighty. But wait, and I'm coming to a close shortly. Paul, you could have stopped here and we get your point forcefully, Paul. Esteem another more highly than himself. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory. Lowliness of mind should clothe our characters such that we seek to lift up another at expense of ourselves. We get it, Paul. But Paul continues and he tells us, well, that's just chapter one. Let me take you deeper. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death. As if becoming a man was not humility enough. The humbling didn't cease, but rather continued unto sub-zero depths to include now death. Paul, you've lost me. I'm no concept how the creator of the universe, who painted the skies and the stars and the sun, who fashioned all there is that is, We're told of the seraphim in Isaiah 6 that had six wings and with two of them they cover their eyes and with two of them they cover their feet and with two of them they do fly. They cover their face because they're unworthy to look upon the holiness of God. They cover their feet because they're unworthy to stand in the presence of God. And with two of the wings they fly and a chorale echoes around heaven's chambers saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of his praise. This God dies 
for sinners. I've no concept of the level of humility involved in such a mystery, but I have to receive it by faith. He humbled himself and became obedient unto death. But not just any death, even the death of the cross, the cross. Who can begin to fathom the depths of Calvary's love? For when we were yet without strength in due time, Paul writes, Christ died for the ungodly. Scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet perhaps for a good man, some would even dare to die. But God commend us his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Romans 5 verses 6 through to 8. The final chapter concludes in verse 9, Wherefore God also has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. His exaltation and glorification. Oh, friends, shall we not bow the knee to such a God? You who are yet unconverted here this morning, you say, does God love me? Friend, I've rest my case. Every facet of God's holy word declares the love of God. But the question now remains, will you bow the knee? Oh, everyone's going to bow the knee one day, you understand? But now is the season of grace where God gives us opportunity to bow the knee voluntarily. And in bowing the knee to resign our rights and to allow him to ascend the throne of our hearts and to govern our lives. And he will give us freely the gift of everlasting life. But friend, if you be found bending the knee on the other side of eternity, you'll you'll not be bowing the knee, friends, unto salvation. You'll be bowing the knee to glorify him, our men and our men. But then you'll be cast and bound hand and foot into the lake of fire for all eternity. As those books are opened, we read of in Revelation chapter 21. Revelation chapter 20. Will we not bow our knee this morning to the king of kings who has loved us with such love, such dying love? At the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. Things in heaven, things in earth, and things under the earth. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Friends, here in his love, not that we loved God, but that God loved us. He loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. The wrath of God passes over yours and mine sins because Christ has bore the penalty of our sin upon Calvary. And so I ask the question now, who wants the glory and honor now in the midst of the assembly of God in light of this? Who wants preeminence? Come on, you're striving for position. You want it now in light of what we've just read. Every single one of us is compelled to take the low place. And that was Paul's point. To esteem my brother more highly than myself. And if I suffer in this world, well, what example has been left us? Okay, so I have to humble myself a little bit and bite my tongue because I might not agree with what someone says. Humiliation, we don't know the half of it. You see, it's important to remind ourselves because with our minds we can be so puffed up at times. And when we behold the glory of scripture, it's like someone putting a pin in a balloon. We're deflated 
And we suddenly realize, oh God, I'm nothing. Who am I to lift back my voice? Who am I to expect to have rights? Who am I to defend myself and to say to another, who do you think you're speaking to? Don't you know who I am? I'm Paul Williams. It's a disgrace. It's a disgrace. Who wants to lord it over another in light of this? To the dust each one of us must go. As I close this morning, I think finally of the great commandment given us by Jesus. A new commandment I give unto you in John 13, 34, that you love one another. And just like Paul said in Philippians 2, it would have been enough if our Lord would have stopped there. I get it. But again, he uses the power of comparison. And in so doing, he moves the quality of love from earth to heaven. A new commandment I give unto you that ye love one another as I have loved you. Oh no. The Lord's now put himself as the subject of comparison. You're to love like this. Calvary's dying love. That you love one another. Brothers and sisters, there are heights of love and depths of humiliation that God wants yet to take each one of us. And my prayer is that he would have his way among his church. Take us lower, Lord, in humiliation, and that's a dangerous thing to ask. Because what we're really asking when we say, God, humble me, is, Lord, humiliate me. Lord, take us higher in love. In love towards the brethren, in love towards our spouse, in love toward our children, our family, our neighbours, our friends, our work colleagues, and yes, even our enemies. May God help us in light of Calvary's dying love to do the same. Amen. Oh, Father, we thank you this morning that we have been challenged to the core of our being, Father. As we have looked, Lord, and had a glimpse this morning of Calvary's dying love. Oh, God, forgive us. Full of pride am I. Vile, Lord, and full of pride. I ask you, Lord, that we might ever lay hold upon what we have read this morning, Calvary's dying love, and that we would humble ourselves, esteem others better than ourselves, love the brethren with thy love, Lord. And we fully recognize this morning that, God, we cannot love with your love without your spirit. And, Father, that you're not exhorting us to try in our own strength. Lord, fill us with your spirit, let us learn to die daily and allow you to have your way in us and through us that we might be your hands of love, that we might be your voice of love, that we might be your vessels of love. God help us, we pray and ask, and we give you all the glory and the honour. King Jesus, reign supreme among us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.